Thank you. So I will present on the very small experience I had. Here are my disclosures. And uh, uh, so we're speaking of cervical uh, artificial disc replacement and uh, these, has been, these have been around uh, for the past 25, 30 years and never caught up until uh, about 2004 when we had new devices. And uh, these are, were the old designs like the Brian, the Prestige, the ProDisc. And uh, we are, fortunately, we are provided now with new designs. Uh, um, and all are the same. You do an anterior approach, a complete disc removal. Uh, you treat the disc herniation. And uh, what you ask for your prosthesis is to be easy to uh, put into place. So we have to start again with a pathology. The cervical disc disease starts early in life, like in the 20s. Cervical disc degeneration, degeneration causes cervical pain, cervical disc hernia with painful neurobrachialgia, chronic myelopathic disc disease, acute myelopathy. And uh, this is due to acute or traumatic disc hernia sometimes. So cervical discogenic pain is uh, present at one time in life in about 80% of adults, and this is not an indication for surgery. Cervical brachial pain is very frequent, and 90% are treated with medical treatment, and we end up operating about 10% of these patients, and uh, sometimes this patient may have excruciating, awful pain. And chronic cervical myelopathy is a high frequency in elderly people, and the main factor is uh, at first a narrow canal and uh, conservative treatment is efficient until the patient has bladder problems. And uh, this is a real problem because if you don't operate before, they stay with their problems. And uh, in elderly patients, it can cause severe progressive disability, even death. Acute traumatic cervical disc hernia, this is a young guy who is in his 20s, and uh, it happens. Sometimes it exists and it may cause paraplegia and uh, there is no conservative treatment, and this may cause severe acute my myelopathy. So, what is cervical disc surgery? Cervical disc removal, simple removal. Um, discectomy has been done by, I'm an orthopod, by neurosurgeons for decades, uh, and uh, gave good results. And uh, you just take out the hernia, take the disc and run, and consider the job is done. However, you remain with neck pain, which is not a problem in ancient conceptions. And late, f late fusion is the best outcome, but most of the time these patients end up in kyphosis. And you see here a patient with a kyphosis and uh, uh, later uh, spondy at the upper level. And this is what happens with these techniques. So, Percutaneous cervical disc for uh, disc removal for herniated disc uh, under local anesthesia is a very good procedure. It's very effective in trained hands. I'm not one of those trained hands, and I think this surgery may be very difficult and uh, uh, may be dangerous when I see what you guys are able to uh, perform with uh, diamond burrs and uh, to remove uh, steel fights and remove. Uh, I mean, wow. This is impressive. I prefer much more easier uh, surgery. ACDF was invented by Robinson in 1952. Uh, so this was anterior lateral approach, iliac crest bone graft, carefully quadruple graft, and this is the gold standard. And it works. Uh, however, you still have deformities, expulsions. Uh, you have a tr still uh, have a three months fusion delay with a plaster cast or hard color and uh, you, have a prob you deal with the problems of bone graft harvesting pathology. Cervical diffusion plus anterior plating, this is what I was trained to do in the 90s. It was invented in se by Senegas in 1977. At this uh, time, you had the first plates. And uh, so, however, you need an extensive approach if you want to put your screws in. You have screw migrations. Okay, later designs like the more surfing, uh, alleviate the problem for uh, the need for uh, bicortical screws. Uh, but you still have a problem with bone graft harvesting. Uh, still the best outcome, gold standard, and you have a one-person problem complication rate. This is difficult surgery. And cervical diffusion plus a cage, uh, alleviate the iliac bone uh, graft harvesting. So you use a bone substitute. 
and the smaller ilia crest bone graft harvesting sometimes. But uh, you still have migration, three months fusion daily. We will plus to cast our heart collar and enter the world of cervical non-union. People say one person, I don't believe that, and uh, the numbers vary from one to maybe 20, maybe more. And uh, so enter the world of full hardware cervical disc surgery. Can we do more, better? We'd like to replace the disc, and uh, we'd like to um, get rid of uh, ancient, ancient decades-old designs with a complex, long surgery. The Brian was a pain in the ass to, uh, for, for the surgeon. And, but overall, we have good results with uh, cervical disc prosthesis, and uh, we have concerns with high rates of fusion and deformities in kyphosis and uh, subsidence. So what if I had the advantage of simple disc removal, the advantage of plating with early mobilization and stability, the advantage of cases with easy implantation and no bone harvesting, and the advantage of cervical disc, uh, uh, artificial disc replacement. Uh, so this one, this patient was my first patient with a pro disc. And just a day after a surgery, he would say, uh, oh no, doctor, I had no problem. Oh yes, everything is go goes right. So I was. I'm unable to shake my, my head like that, but these patients actually can do. So I want to take out the disc and run, fill the gap and stay filled, go home, discharge the patient the next day, forget about non-union, be able to have an MRI the next time. So, and I do not truly really care about fusion, which was a good result we had with the previous techniques. So this is a short list for a new cervical disc. I will be, okay. So uh, we use the, PICOR, P-E-E-K, which is a polyethyl ether ketone. Uh, this is a high-performance organic thermoplastic polymer, which was introduced in 1976. Uh, it is a self-lubricating material, which is used for, uh, um, in industry for bearings. Uh, and uh, we have more than 10,000 cycles in vitro uh, trials with uh, no wear or minimal wear. And the only problem is very expensive. So this is what we invented in 2010, if I remember. And uh, okay, this is a small series with this prosthesis. This is what it looks. So this is what we've done. So here is our series from 2011 to 2017, small series, only 50 patients. We had no death, no neurological complication, no infection. We had 19 female, 31 male. The mean age was 53 years old, 28 to 83. And myelopathy was present in 12 cases. At this time, I started operating new myelopathies with a cervical dysprosthesis. It was a bit so. So now uh, you can do that, and it's even uh, an official indication, what's, uh, what I believe. We had one reoperation, and the technique was a left anterior cervical approach with a skin incision, which is now two centimeters, no muscle splitting. You, we preserve the homohyoid muscle. We expose only the disc. We just cut the uh, anterior muscle. We use a Caspar retractor. We do the complete disc removal and uh, we uh, take out the hernia and consider the job is done, and then we implant our device and go. We have a smaller series with patients with more than two year follow up and we were able, who were able to fill the full uh, self questionnaires like, like the uh, neck disability index and the RAND SF36 questionnaire which is a little bit long and all the patients tend to have difficulties. So we still have 30 cases, 14 female, 16 male, 53 years old, 28 to 83, 13 at the double level operation. These are the levels, C5, 6, 6, 7, C3, C4, C5, C5, C6, 6, 7, 5. And these are the height of the components that were used. The mean operating time was very low, 58 minutes. The mean hospital stay was two days. Uh, the mean uh, range of motion after two years was 10 degrees. Uh, patients were back to work after two months. 91% uh, of the patients would have a surgery again, and the NDI was uh, 56 to 13.6 uh, after two years of the operation. These are the actual uh, charts where you can see the, uh, this is in French, I'm sorry. 
uh, different components of uh, SF36. We had uh, one complication. Uh, one of our patients was uh, at the uh, attempt a strangulation by a girlfriend. This happens, so she had a little bit of uh, subsidence and was uh, treated conservatively until uh, it healed, and she, she has a good result now. And I had to operate on one patient who uh, had a recurrent uh, neurobrachialgia with uh, minimal, um, minimal foraminal decompression I had down, and her EMG was not very um, uh, satisfactory, so I, I took out the disc and uh, did a fusion with plate. She still has bad results, and I think she's on workers' compensation now uh, after two years. So this is one case we operated. These are cases. This is a two-level uh, disc hernia with a myelopathy in this patient. So he's had a, a two-level disc replacement. She's had a two-level disc replacement. This is her after the surgery. And this is her after two years. This is a one-level disc hernia. This is just after the surgery. This is after two years. And uh, you see it moves. This is a patient. I'm sorry, I can still show the faces of the patients uh, while doing a presentation. But I think with face recognition software, one day we'll not be able. The patient, of course, uh, gave their approval to that. So this is what the scar looks like after two years. Uh, OK, nobody knows he has a prosthesis and he has a good result. Uh, this is uh, another case with, uh, I think, was a myelopathy with uh, hypersenial inside the muscle. Okay, and this is a scar. This is one of our first cases. So, so far, the implant performed well. Uh, we had no 